So, welcome everybody to our today's online event, hosted by the Center for Eastern European and International Studies in Berlin. I'm delighted that we will discuss this very exciting book in the following hour, Marco Poliari's Ukrainian, Russophone, Other Russian, Hybrid Identities and Narratives in Post-Soviet Culture and Politics, published by Peter Lang this year. I'm even more delighted that today's event is the first episode of our newly founded series, Russophone Voices, the Words and Wall of Russian Language Literature, which is co-organized by Naomi Kaffee, Miriam Finkelstein, Marco Poliari, and myself. In this series, we will discuss Russophone literatures. We will talk about and with Russophone writers, and as we will do today, we will also discuss current research on Russophone literatures and cultures. Before we start our today's discussion, let me very briefly introduce our panel. I'm very glad to welcome the author of the book, Marco Poleri, who is a research fellow in post-Soviet studies and a joint professor of history of Eastern Europe, nation building and protection of minorities at the University of Bologna. Marco, good to have you here. I would also like to welcome Miriam Finkelstein, who is an assistant professor working in the Literary and Cultural Studies Research Area at the Institute of Slavic Studies, University of Graz. Well, I'm glad that you're with us. And I would like to welcome Roman Glasiewicz, who is junior professor of Ukrainian Cultural Studies at the University of Graz. Roman, I'm glad that you're on board. My name is Nina Fries. I'm a researcher at the Center for Eastern European and International Studies, and I'm your host today. So what we have planned for today. First, Marco is going to give us a very short overview on what his book is about. We will then hear about Miriam's and Roman's reading impressions, followed by a more open discussion of the book. Finally, we will have a Q&A section, and I would like to encourage uh, the audience to send us your questions using the chat box in the stream. But OK, let's get started. Marco, you will have the possibility to share some of your key arguments and findings in a minute. But before, I would like to know who should read your book and why. You can hear me yeah. well. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude to you and Zoys and to our distinguished discussants and speakers today for joining this debate. I'm very Glad of that, and I'm really grateful to you for giving me this opportunity. This is actually the first official presentation of my book uh, since um, I, I published it in May uh, when uh, the pandemic in Italy and Europe was still at its worst. So, um, and we had already planned a presentation in September, and we hoped that it, it could be alive. It could be live, but uh, actually, I'm very grateful to you also to have found uh, the best. Uh, possible potential platform for our discussion with having uh, all together here from uh, Italy and uh, and Germany. So coming to your questions, I I believe that uh, many the potential readers of my book could be primarily scholars and researchers in Ukrainian and Russian studies, of course. But uh, in a broader sense, I believe that uh, when writing this book, I tried to answer all those questions that uh, arose throughout uh, uh, 10 years of research on contemporary Ukraine, uh, also from conversations with people working in, uh, in the cultural industry, in, uh, in academia, or even engaged in political life in Ukraine and abroad. So my idea was uh, exactly to reframe some of the uh, broader issues around, uh, around the language question, the language issue, the uh, issues concerning also the elaboration and the formation of a national canon in the post-Soviet era, adopting a kind of a third perspective, we could say. So trying to adopt the perspective of those people who find themselves uh, in between Russia and Ukraine uh, today. So uh, for this reason, I believe that uh, people who could be uh, interested in uh, reading my book it could be those, all those who have been fascinated by the intersection and the uh, complex mosaics of people, cultures, and languages uh, in the history of Ukraine, but also people who had the chance to follow the uh, cultural and social developments and political developments in Ukraine throughout the last uh, three decades. 
um, I guess that maybe something uh, important to say is what readers will not find in my book too. So um, I believe that this book uh, is not, first of all, a history of Ukrainian-Russian language literature, because such a venture would be uh, quite difficult to undertake and even impossible today uh, when uh, such a history has not been written yet, and especially because of uh, ideological prejudices that, of course, arose in the aftermath of the a political crisis uh, in the country, and especially around the Russian-Ukrainian uh, cultural relations uh, in, the, in the latest years, maybe would prevent from such a, a project, from such an idea. But of course, uh, um, it is, uh, I, I tried to mean this book as a way to open a potential discussion, to give uh, the ground for a potential discussion around this issue, uh, not only in a local and national perspective, but also trying to uh, open the field to uh, the global issue of the need for Russophone studies, for Russophone studies. And that's exactly what uh, together we are trying to do in our cycle of, of events. And I hope that we will manage to do that. Okay, great. I, I think this is uh, surely uh, one of the, the goals of your book, uh, and I'm quite sure that uh, it will be successful. So I would uh, ask you now to share your presentation with us um, so that we can get some in, uh, input and uh, an impression of what your book is about for all of us, uh, all of our audience who haven't, haven't read it yet. Okay, thank you, Nina. I hope that uh, we will manage to show that presentation without any technical problems. So can you see the slides? Yes. Oh, great, great. So I will try to be very brief. I will try to be very brief. And uh, to summarize some of the main lines presented in my book uh, for the audience, uh, to leave then the floor to Miriam and Roman and to open the discussion. Uh, as you can see, I prepared a few slides for entertaining also visually uh, our audience while having this uh, uh, brief presentation with the aim to provide food to, for our discussion. As I tried to emphasize before, I, I, in my book I explored the major categorization of uh, identities and narratives in the public discourse around Ukraine, Russia, and the recent Ukraine crisis. I guess that it became quite clear to external observers, researchers, scholars, uh, especially after the so-called Ukraine crisis, that after Euromaidan in 2014, the annexation of Crimea to Russia, and the start of the war in Donbas, social polarization has been mainly harshened by the misuse of cultural categories in the political discourses in both countries. Uh, categories such as the ones included in this slide came to embody a true struggle between different social, political, and ideological positions. Um, the very title of my book uh, is exactly a provocation aimed to address and to deconstruct these identity categories, Ukrainian, Russophone, other Russian. Um, the term Russophonia, in my view, um, bring back to the broader issue concerning the recognition of Russian as a world language and the highly diverse use and role of Russian culture locally. Then the term other Russian brings back to the complex history of the Russian people, their migrations, diasporic uh, presence worldwide, and the diversity of subjectivities at stake. While finally the term Ukrainian, in my view, can also reveal a universe of different perspectives on the way one can feel Ukrainian and at the same time can maintain a link to other cultures and traditions. Um, it is no surprise that especially in times of political transition, identities can assume a kind of static value of definitional formulas. And that's what happened in Ukrainian political, political and even intellectual debates, where the identity question has been often associated with the language one speak. Here in this slide, um, we see how cultural and political categories can easily intersect in the public debate. We see this sign held by a supporter of Ukrainian language during a demonstration organized after the approval of the new state language law in 2019. In this case, the idea of a cultural de-Russification of the country, the Russificatia, 
is equated with the idea of a deoccupation of the country, the occupazia, or the military liberation of the country from the invader or the occupier. Finally, bringing to the historical result of decolonizing the country, the colonizazia, from the yoke of the Russian Federation today, but also, and meaningfully, from its colonial past in imperial and Soviet times. As a result, we see our strict ideological divide between labels such as Russians and Ukrainians, Russian speakers and Ukrainian speakers, or even the Ukrainian language literature and Russian language one can easily emerge. These categories belong not only to post-war realities, but actually characterized the Ukrainian political discourse since the dawn of the post-Soviet era. Uh, that's why I believe that the Ukrainian crisis, uh, and that's what I try also to emphasize in my book, uh, more than revealing a political crisis arising between Ukraine and Russia, or in a global perspective between the EU and Russia and so on, revealed the existence of an epistemological crisis in understanding the content and scope of Ukrainian and Russian national identities. This is one of the reasons behind the main focus of my book that is around the role and position of Russian-speaking subjectivities in Ukraine. We usually think about a strict connection between the idea of states and the idea of national languages. On the one hand, I believe that the starting point should be reversed, whereby we see how throughout the post-Soviet years, alternative identities were created by people who speak Russian in Ukraine and cannot be connected to the, to the idea of a link to the Russian state. Uh, in the following slide, uh, we see, for example, the role and voice of Andrei Kurkov, one of the most famous Ukrainian writers who write his works in Russian and has been translated into many Western European languages. In this uh, interview conducted in uh, 2018, uh, the author claims this new role for Russian language and Russian language speakers in the country supporting the need for institutionalizing Ukrainian Russian as a Ukrainian cultural good. Comparing the case of Ukraine and the case of Ukrainian Russian and Ukrainian Russophonia to the one experienced by other world languages, as in the case of English, French, and Spanish, and as you can see and as you can read in these slides, um, Kurkov uses and, and compares this situation with the one of Francophonie 150 years ago, uh, the author tries exactly to deconstruct the idea of Russian language and culture as only connected to the idea of the Russian state. Uh, on the other hand, it is a matter of fact today that these identities, uh, Russian identities and Russian-speaking identities, have been alternatively appropriated or rejected in the post-Soviet Russian and Ukrainian political discourses, where an ideological attachment to what we could describe as a quasi-romantic idea of nation based on language, literature, and territory gradually emerged. This way, Russophone identity gradually became a kind of intermediate position between the two poles, Russia and Ukraine. And Russophone intellectuals began to create their own independent narratives of self-identification, affecting the very content of what Russianness and Ukrainianness were there to mean. So, and summarizing, I could say that the questions at the core of the book are very diverse. First of all, what is the role and position of Russophone Russian culture in Ukraine today? What is the potential novelty of this intermediate position between national discourses? Or who owns the right to speak in the name of Russian speakers? And finally, can there be the room for another Russian world, different from the one promoted by the Russian Federation or strictly opposed by non-Russian national majorities in the post-Soviet space? Within this frame, it should be no surprise that Russophonia or Russian-speaking identity as a unified political or cultural category still does not have a voice of its own in Ukraine, but exists as a universe of different potential identity narratives. It's still in a state of formation, be it as a cultural category or a political one, and has been never institutionalized in the country. So, for these reasons, I decided to explore the diversity of Ukrainian Russophonia, not only as a way to rethink the true content of today's Ukrainian society, but also as the starting point to rethink Russian as a global language, as a world language that mainly belongs to its speakers who gradually start to be aware of the possibility to use Russian differently. In the following slide, 
Um, we can see that this is the case, for example, of Boris Kersonsky, a Ukrainian-Russian language poet based in Odessa. While preparing this presentation, I came upon, upon a poem posted a few days ago by Kersonsky, where he exactly referred to this kind of awareness and possibility to use Russian differently. Here you can see the first lines of the poem stating the following. My native language is Russian with a touch of Yiddish, with a bit of Ukrainianism, what a strange mix. I guess this is um, a kind of a, this is exactly this kind of understanding that reflects the multiple cultural roots of the author, a Ukrainian Russian language poet with Jewish origins. This kind of multiple identification is not only true for the case of Ukraine, but belongs to a broader debate that goes on worldwide in different national and regional contexts where Russian speaking culture is forming. Uh, we can see the example uh, of Svetlana Alexievich, who has received the Nobel Prize in 2015 and made this issue of uh, global, I would say, interest. And within this context, of course, um, Russophone literature in Ukraine gradually emerged in a rather informal scene as a speech act able to create different narratives around identity, reshaping the multiplicity of experiences around the Russian and Ukrainian identities and revealing the need for overcoming the so-called struggle based on language issues. In this slide, we see, for example, the cover of a recent anthology published in 2016 by one of the largest publishing houses in Ukraine, Folio, based in Kharkiv. We aim to gather together the most prominent Russian language authors in the country as belonging to Russian literature of Ukraine or Ukrainian Russian language literature. We Maybe we, will, we could come then back to the issue of term, around terminology. Here we see the need to clarify how language use itself does not determine the rigid and full-fledged mindset itself, and even the uh, appropriation of this cultural production by one of the two uh, contenders, by one of the two uh, fields in the era, so uh, Ukrainian literature and Russian literature. So uh, to conclude, in the first part of the book, I tried to grasp uh, the kind of epistemological crisis that followed the Soviet collapse and the main attitudes in describing the Lithophonia as a non existent, marginal, and mostly ignored element. While in the second part of the book, uh, I tried to look at the transitory consecration of hybridity as the potential for the new political project arising from Euromaidan and the Ukraine crisis, and see here the case of the so called Ukrainian Russian patriots. Uh, unfortunately, and I believe that we will uh, have the chance to talk about that in our discussion, the prolongation of the war in East Ukraine has brought again to a new radicalizing of positions in the public debate. And to what Kersonsky in these slides, that is taken also from a recent post published on Facebook, it described as a, a state of linguistic discomfort even in post Maidan Ukraine. But I believe that I could stop here um, also for the sake for our discussion and uh, leave the floor to again to Nina. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. You can uh, now um, unshare your screen. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, and I would uh, like uh, to ask uh, Roman and Miriam to share their reading impressions with us. Roman, would you uh, go first um, and maybe tell us what did you learn from Marcus' book uh, and why uh, is the book important? Uh, can you hear me? Oh, yes. Yeah, first of all, thank you uh, to you, Nina, and to Marco and Miriam for having you and it's such a great uh, um, an opportunity to discuss the book and also hope also to thank all the participants uh, online whom I don't uh, see even but I hope whom, whom I hope uh, listen to our conversation I'm really I was really very excited about the book for for several reasons uh, and I think it is important, uh, as Marco, uh, Marco suggested, for Russian studies and also for Ukrainian studies particularly. First of all, because of the normalcy taken for grantedness, Marco was trying to speak about the Russophone literature. And, uh, and it was really exciting because um, as, as an organizer of Ukrainian summer school, of course, I realized in the recent uh, decade that Primarily, we were inviting uh, Ukraine foreign speakers or Ukraine foreign writers or uh, figures from, from cultural life. 
But um, when uh, one time we, or two times, we in, in, invited authors uh, whom Marco is uh, talking about in his book were uh, um, the opportunities connected to the war. So I discovered Boris Helsonsky not primarily as a Russophone writer, but as a writer who tried in his poetry to establish a very critical position to, to the conflictual polarized, uh, polarized war camps in Ukraine, being very... Um, in trying to develop a very tragic view of, of this disconnection. So, uh, and, and uh, uh, thanks to Marco, I learned that, uh, uh, that, that one can compose as many writers, the second one was uh, um, Olena Stjashkina, that, uh, that this normal to, to try to compose uh, the, whole, the whole field of Russophone literature in Ukraine. And I, I, I thought, I think it's a very big achievement of this book, this courage and freedom, not being so fixated on war and, and the trauma of the war, uh, which perhaps occupied many people in Ukrainian studies, but try to, to, to take a step back and look at uh, Russophone literature as a field. Um, the, the, the second um, thing uh, which was very important to me just to discover uh, uh, this, uh, this, this effort by Marco to um, um, to develop a very wide scope, beginning with lit literary texts, uh, uh, going to social media, then to uh, to the book market, to the prizes, and then to the politics. I think it's also very unique, uh, unique, uh, unique panorama of very different fields. Uh, and, and this is also uh, what made me uh, really think about uh, how many contexts and how many factors influence the life of, lit the life of literature as such. Yeah literature in empire, literature in the nation state, literature in, in revolution, literature in a book market, literature in individual traje trajectories and individual paths the authors are going to, literature and globalization. I think uh, I was really excited to, to, to see how Marco um, develops his argument over a, a very wide range of the fields. And um, the, uh, the last most exciting thing, thing uh, which also um, um, was a touch on my uh, interest, uh, research interest, was also the application of the post-colonial theory to, uh, to Ukrainian case. It's a very uh, contested, uh, very interesting field, very debated field, especially his application of the category of hybridity. Um, can we describe the, the processes where uh, uh, Russophone writers can begin writing in Ukrainian? Is this a hybridity uh, in this post-colonial sense, or is it rather dehybridization under the umbrella of quasi-hybridity? Is it a simulacrum of hybridity, or is it a real hybridity? This was one point uh, which really was interesting to me to see how, how, uh, how, how the concept of hybridity is used and especially uh, the concept developed in the diaspora, the diasporical center of, uh, of, uh, of migration in, in, in Great Britain or in, in, in the United States or in France, how these concepts are used in Ukraine and what are the implications of this concept. And um, yes, and uh, um, it, 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 the, the usage of, of post-colonial theories, the application of the Deleuzean notion of, uh, of this minor literature was, uh, was uh, very exciting to me, and I hope we will have a chance later to, to discuss it. And um, yeah, just to conclude, um, one of the also important discoveries was that the topic of Russophone literature was uh, it was was it was it was a, a theme was a was was um, current in Ukrainian studies, but despite of the declarations of the f uh, uh, founding fathers of contemporary Ukrainian studies like George Habovich, of course, or Emil Kopovich, uh, uh, the debate didn't move much beyond the declarations of uh, George Habovich declaring the importance of including the Russian Jewish literature or Polish literature in Ukrainian canon, but. Uh, working all his life on Shevchenko, or Makov Pavlishin also introducing post-colonial concepts in Ukrainian studies, but also being uh, all the time focused on Ukrainian foreign writers. So I think Marco, uh, Marco, Marco, Marco <laughs> touches on a very important gap uh, in, in Ukrainian studies and also in Russophone, uh, in, 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 in Russian studies, uh, and the question of emancipation of the Russian civilization of the 
uh, authoritarian political tradition. Thank you, Romana. Yeah, and would you like to share some of your thoughts on the book with us? Yes, thank you so much. I'm very, very happy to be here with you tonight, and I'm very honored and very proud of being part of this uh, amazing enterprise on Russophone literatures and cultures on a global scope, which is this the first evening. Um, personally, I have hugely enjoyed Marco's book for a number of reasons, and I obviously I second everything Roman said before. Um, I, unlike Roman, I'm not a specialist in Ukrainian literature, I specialize in Russian literature. So for me, this book was, um, it allowed for a great insight into the condition of Ukraine literature today or in the mo more contemporary uh, decades um, for someone who is obviously is not as specialist as is Roman um, to learn about the issues and the problems that are raised uh, that were raised in recent years. Um, but uh, so which is why I can only recommend anyone who is interested in Ukraine and Ukraine um, Ukrainian literatures, Ukrainian understood here as a territory, obviously, and not Ukraine phone. I can, I would really greatly recommend reading this book um, just to get an idea of what is going on. Um, the other reason, and I was, uh, I admit I was fairly late in understanding this. It only occurred to me while I was finishing the book or after reading the book. Um, this book, um, well, for one thing, it performs an enormous task, a twofold task, because it simultaneously discusses Ukrainian literature, Ukrainophone literatures, and Russophone literatures. And by doing so, I think it also does something very, very important for my field of study, for, for the Russian studies, because at times explicitly, at times implicitly, it raises the question as to the future of of our very own field, of the field of Russian studies. Um, by bringing, by focusing on exactly the questions and the issues we have heard earlier from Marco himself, what is Russian? What is the Russian world? Where does it begin? Where does it end? How do we define these individuals? How do we define these languages? And this, uh, ultimately, it all affects the question of who we are as scholars of Russian literature and culture, who we want to be, who we can be, and how we wish to understand our field of study in the future. This is something Marco also explicitly mentions in his study. Um, are we looking at a turn maybe away from Russian studies as focused on Russia, uh, maybe equated to Russia studies towards Russophone studies that would also include Russophone literary and cultural production on a global scale, no longer treating them as somehow marginal or peripheral, but as an integral part of what we do. Um, as um, Marco has uh, demonstrated in his book on, on multiple occasions. So this is, for me, this book is really, uh, in a way, it is really a game changer because it raises such fundamental issues um, also about the, as I have said, the future of our um, field. And, and it allows for whoever reads carefully, uh, maybe a glimpse into a possible future of uh, what we're going to do, what we could do. Um, and I have uh, my question or what I would really like to learn more about and this is something uh, Marco himself have, has uh, mentioned before, and Roman has now mentioned as well. It is the question or the problem, the way I see it, of the Western reception. Um, just to take this line of thought further, what Roman had said before, um, in the German-speaking continuum, and this is the only one I can really speak for, um, we see a lot of translations of Ukrainophone writers. We have Andruhovich, we have Zhadan, we have many others. But with the exception of Kurkov, the German language audience uh, cannot access these texts. They cannot read them. They are not translated. And to my knowledge, neither into English, for instance. Question it would be, on a more speculative note, 
why is this the case? Why is this the case? Why are our institutions, such as publishers, translators, agent, and so on, uh, apparently maybe reluctant um, to include this part of Ukraine, contemporary Ukrainian literature and culture in their portfolios? Uh, in other words, what is our part, our responsibility, also as, as scholars, in presenting, in making this literature accessible um, to uh, audiences, non-Russophone, non-Ukrainophone uh, audiences, what are the possible obstacles or the impediments um, to such, such a reception um, elsewhere? So that would be my question. Um, and kudos, I think this is a great book, um, just not to let it go unmentioned. Thank you. So, thank you so much, Miriam. Marco, this was a lot of praise for you, <laughs> but uh, maybe you would like to pick out uh, something uh, and maybe we could also um, continue discussing Miriam's question, unless this is maybe rather a question for uh, the many publishers who are listening to, to us right now. So <laughs> if you are outside, please let us know, why don't you publish Russophone literature from Ukraine? But yeah, Marco, the floor is yours. Maybe you have some reactions to uh, what was just said, and maybe we could uh, afterwards jump in with um, thinking about Miriam's question. So, first of all, I would like to thank Miriam and Roman for their words, and, espe and especially for hiding uh, the flaws of the book and emphasizing uh, uh, the positive aspects. I really, I'm really uh, glad of that, especially. And um, of course, um, they touched the very interesting and very important issues. And uh, I believe that uh, while writing this book, and uh, we had also the chance to discuss these issues together with Nina and Miriam in uh, other uh, occasions, um, I was exactly thinking about the importance of this issue for uh, the future of, uh, of our of Russian studies, of Ukrainian studies, and, uh, uh, and the need for, uh, for uh, in a way, answering the so-called transnational turn in humanities that has recently, in a way, uh, been recognized not only by uh, scholars in uh, Russian and Ukrainian studies, but even worldwide. Uh, my experience as a PhD student in Italy, for example, uh, told me a lot about that while trying to analyze such a subject as uh, Ukrainian Russophone literature, contemporary Ukrainian Russophone literature. Uh, it was even difficult to me to find a kind of uh, uh, exact and and, uh, and uh, definite uh, academic field where where to work in, and so um, and I guess that uh, a lot of uh, uh, scholars and researchers in Russian and Ukrainian studies emphasize the need to overcome, in a way, methodological nationalism, as we can call it, uh, while addressing such issues concerning authors and writers who work in. Uh, uh, in the national, national context, we could say. So that's why I believe that, for example, our common effort to uh, emphasize, to uh, reflect, to work on, a, on the creation of a potential field as the uh, Russophone uh, literary studies, uh, I believe it is a, is, a, is a very important thing for all of us because this, uh, this kind of approach, in a way, can help us to break this kind of approach to cultural production as only linked to, uh, how to say, continuous national traditions that, in a way, are continuous in time and can be defined only following, for example, territorial limitation, the limitations, and so on. So the, the main problem in this venture is, of course, a problem concerning institutionalization. So. Uh, we do not have uh, proper and clear cultural institutions that support uh, such, a, uh, such a view of things. Uh, we can just think about the, uh, the, the position of this cultural production, as, uh, as Miriam emphasized, um, as, uh, as, not, uh, as, uh, as, um, as very few uh, as a very few potential, a little potential to come to Western Western literary market. This mainly depends, uh, and the success of these authors mainly depends from the uh, 
uh, ventures, uh, private ventures of scholars. So engage scholars that in a way try to support this kind of informal uh, cultural mo movements in the region. But of course, this cannot be enough. Uh, we should need a, a proper engagement of institutions in, in Ukraine and in the West to support uh, the promotion of this kind of cultural production. This is a problem that I faced even in uh, Ukraine itself when I tried to look for these books of Ukrainian uh, Russian language authors. It came to me that the only place where I could go was the black market in Kiev, in Petrivka. <laughs> the books were coming back from Russia as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as I try also to explain in my book, most of these books were published in uh, Russia first and then came back to the Ukrainian market and so became only then a Ukrainian cultural product. I guess these are very important issues that uh, that should be addressed not only by scholars, uh, but also by, by institutions and political institutions, of course, because uh, we are dealing with a, a culture that lives within a global market. And so, um, of course, the directions of the potential fate of this cultural production is, uh, is also uh, affected by the directions and the tastes of, of literary market. Uh, and the last time I, I, we were talking about the case of uh, Vladimir uh, Rafienko um, as a, a Ukrainian Russian language writer from Donetsk who has still uh, not published uh, his books in the, in, the Western, in the Western market. Actually, other authors such as Alexei Nikitin from Kiev managed to publish their book in, uh, in, uh, in the West exactly because of the role held by the Russian publishing, publishing house, the Russian publishers, in promoting them and in, uh, and in, uh, in a way uh, managing also to sell the rights to publish these works within some broader agreements with, uh, uh, for example, Italian or, uh, or British publishers. So I see uh, we can, in a way, set a kind of agenda to promote this kind of cultural produ production, but we should be still aware that uh, uh, it is informal links and it is uh, uh, informal cultural uh, life and directions that, uh, um, that uh, uh, conduct the life of, of this kind of cultural production. So we are still not talking about a fully recognized cultural field as the Russo one one. And one of the aspects that maybe uh, remained out of the scope of my book was the one of the a production that is usually published in internet and the a kind of uh, a communication that goes on through media and the way all these authors come to be connected in a broader and worldwide uh, Russian, uh, Russian literary or Russophone literary landscape. And so I guess that a lot of research needs to be made about the, this issue, not only about Ukrainian Russophone literature, but even in the broader post-Soviet region and even uh, worldwide. And I would like to stop here, maybe. Well, I guess these are good news for all those uh, of you who would like to uh, to get involved in this kind of research. Uh, Miriam and Roman, uh, who of you wants to, to continue, who wants to jump in with uh, more comments on that or one of your other questions or even critique? Uh, we haven't. <laughs> Uh, haven't mentioned yet. Yeah, please go ahead. I could. I have something to say, but perhaps after. After. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, yes. This is this is really incredibly interesting and important. Maybe one uh, small remark about the literary taste you have mentioned. Um, I thought it in particular particularly interesting that or or telling about um, uh, how these except for Kurkov. Um, the writers weren't translated in the German context um, because you have emphasized on several occasions that they combine different literary and cultural traditions in their works, um, relying not only on, on the Russian literary tradition and the Ukrainian literary tradition, but also on others, such as, you know, magical realism, for instance, which made me think that, that these texts would really be so compatible with the Western taste, they would be so interesting. There would be, um, I guess, few obstacles for the readers um, to read them. Um, the other question I was thinking about all this time, the other thing, is, um, Marco, you have addressed a 
very particular generation. Um, you have analyzed their books, their texts in your book. Uh, except for Kurkov, all of them were born in the 1960s. So they are still part of a Soviet tradition. They have the Soviet heritage, which they also always um, or frequently discuss and frequently address in their works. Um, my question would be, uh, have you looked or are there, for instance, younger writers, writers belong to more recent generations, who were, for instance, born after independence in the already independent state, how do they address similar issues? Or is it an issue at all for them? Maybe that had already changed. Um, as well as, and this is, this is maybe a slight attempt at criticism on my part. Um, I felt that your book very strongly focuses on male subjectivities and, 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 and positions. And I would be interested in learning more about um, um, what women writers have to say uh, about this, um, because we know that there are a lot of really, really prominent women poets, women prose writers. So maybe you could uh, share some of your knowledge about that with us as well. Thank you. Marco, please go ahead. So thank you, Miriam, for your questions and for your offering your insights. I believe that you are right. Actually, um, I, when I tried to make a selection of the potential authors and the potential works to focus on, I, um, I, I, I didn't consider, I, I tried to consider mainly prose writers uh, born in the, uh, still in the Soviet Union and so experiencing also this kind of, uh, we could say, a passage from Soviet times to post-Soviet times and in this way also coming to question their own identity uh, from Soviet to post-Soviet times. Uh, I believe that, of course, there are uh, young writers belonging to a younger generation, and there are, of course, um, female writers who are, uh, who are uh, worth analyzing uh, in, in future uh, academic ventures. And I believe that especially the Maidan revolution in Kiev brought to the forefront of the attention to center stage uh, some of uh, uh, the most prominent U Ukrainian Russian language uh, uh, poets. I, I can just mention, for example, uh, the role and position of uh, Yevgenia, Bil Yevgenia Bilchenko with her poem Ktoya, that was then that became a kind of manifesto of uh, Maidan protest um, in in Kiev. Or also, we can uh, uh, think about Anastasia Afanasieva or Anastasia Dmitruk that uh, uh, in, a, in a way also tried to answer the need for uh, investigating uh, uh, as a uh, uh, prominent Russian scholar Ilya Kukulin poses it, investigating disidentification poetically. And so there is also this kind of attempt to deconstruct the idea of being Russian and of being Ukrainian. In my book, I, I referred only briefly to the case of Olena Stiashkina that uh, a Russian language writer from uh, Donetsk who then moved to uh, to Kiev or to uh, the, the uh, government control regions of Ukraine later, that also in, in her works uh, tries to analyze the position of, uh, um, of, um, of women facing the um, historical traumas coming from the collapse of the Soviet Union first and the uh, developments in the post-Soviet era too. Uh, I believe that there are really many directions that could be undertaken while, uh, while studying Ukrainian uh, Russophone uh, literature. I, 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 I focus mostly on, on the four authors, Alexei Nikitin, Andrei Kurkov, Vladimir Rafienko, and uh, Alexander Kabanov, but I'm sure that the uh, textual analysis should be uh, quite uh, uh, developed more in, in other studies. And I really hope that new um, researchers will join my venture, our venture, in, in analyzing such a, a based cultural production. Um, another issue that I would like to uh, highlight before giving again the floor to, to Nina is that in my book I tried to 
uh, intersect these different perspectives as emphasized by uh, Roman, so sociological analysis of the Ukrainian context, uh, um, uh, politological studies, uh, um, broad cultural studies, and then textual analysis too, um, because in a way the main aim of my book or what I tried to do in my book, what I tried to present in my book was to analyze exactly this kind of correlation between political forces and cultural production. So the way uh, they mutually affected each other and so uh, how the formation of national identity in Ukraine came to, to be also reflected in the cultural uh, history of Ukraine in post-Soviet times. So I hope that I answered your questions in a way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Roman, before we go on with you, I uh, would like to encourage the audience, if you have any questions, don't be shy. Uh, please use the chat box uh, in the screen and uh, ask uh, Marco or whomever what you would like him to ask, and then uh, we will hand in your question. But uh, unless we don't have any questions yet, I would, Roman, ask to go on. Uh, yes, I, I think what is, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I think what is uh, interesting and that I would, would, what I was um, thinking about while reading Marco's book was uh, how, um, how re what kind of revolution happened and how this revolution is connected to literature, how, um, um, how, justified, <laughs> um, how justified is a connection uh, between uh, or direct uh, causality between uh, this uh, political upheaval um, taking place in Ukraine and the revolutionary change in literature. On the one hand, as, as, as many people would, would, would argue, there is uh, the prominence of or, uh, coming to the fore of a Russian uh, Russophone literature. But at the same time, if you take a closer look at, at people who are coming to the fore, and I think some of them are the protagonists of Marco's narrative, uh, people like Kukov or Rafienka, Khersonsky, uh, these are people who himself, in my eyes, represent or embody a very, a very big tension and some very, um, some significant contradictions. For example, Khersonsky writing extraordinary uh, poetry, but at the same time, recently writing a, 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 a kind of patriotic poetry glorifying Ukrainian soldiers. Uh, fighting, uh, defending Ukrainian d democracy. So I think the most, uh, the, the most of the poets um, or writers uh, Marco, um, Marco envisaged somehow embarked on this project of nation building. And I just ask myself, of course, there is some some uh, synergy between the liberation of of um, of, of, of political forces and this uh, uh, kind of grassroots initiatives. But I think what was really uh, sad to see about Ukraine, and it's perhaps a challenge to say it as a, as a person representing Ukrainian studies, how quickly all these grassroots initiatives on the political field, but also in the literary realm, were absorbed by this nation building. Yes, and it was very interesting to see how this rhetoric of, uh, of, um, of writing in Russian was very quickly connected to writing in Russian uh, uh, <laughs> um, in, in favor of Ukrainian nation building projects, however liberal, however demo de democratic it is. And I, th I thought uh, perhaps we could a bit slow down here and look concretely at the agenda of every 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 author by writing in Russophone poetry. And uh, I think it reminded me very strong of this uh, discussion of, of the 20s, of this Ukrainian uh, renaissance, Ukrainian, Ukrainian Vidvodzhenia, where it um, seems that uh, uh, getting a communist future was made dependent in a way from uh, getting through through a Ukrainization. So in, in my view, there's also pressure uh, from uh, Ukrainian society, not only from the elites, but also from below, from this common ideological climate. Um, that uh, in order to become a European, you have to be hybridized. But in Ukrainian case, it, hybridization means you have to be Ukrainized. So I don't, I can barely remember a single Ukrainian author switching into uh, Russian or starting writing 
deliberately into Russian to, 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 to build this bridge also to the Russophone tradition. So I think uh, that was something I was thinking while reading Marco's um, uh, uh, book. Um, yeah, what, what kind of hybridity we, we have to, uh, to deal with and what kind of magic realism uh, we have to deal uh, with. Okay, I guess this uh, question goes perfectly along with our first question from the audience we got from uh, Alina Yashina from Gießen University. So um, what Alina writes is, thank you very much for the exciting discussion. My question to Marco, I've been wondering since, as you argue, the language per se doesn't seem to determine the mindset in countries such as Ukraine, what are then the other meaning, uh, meanings of Russianness and Ukraineness that have emerged across your research? In what relationship do they stand to each other, i.e., what is the phase of hybridity in your case, and in what ways is it developing, and in what ways is it developing? Okay, so uh, first of all, I would like to thank also um, our, uh, our, uh, the researcher who joined our discussion, I'm very glad of that. And uh, I would like to answer first to the uh, points uh, uh, raised by uh, Roman, because I believe they are very important issues uh, and they are uh, great food for discussion, of course. Um, how has the revolution changed the literature in Ukraine? I believe that the, uh, we should divide, of course, a, a kind of um, um, period or term that we could describe as a uh, as a, a kind of revolutionary agenda in Ukraine coming out exactly in times of, of, of the revolution, and so in the early times of the revolution, so going from November till uh, March 2000, November 2013 to March 2014, where we saw that uh, in, uh, in Kiev, a lot of authors, a lot of cultural actors, and not only were there to, to meet, to uh, give uh, uh, shared uh -huh. lectures or readings in both Ukrainian and Russian, and the same happened with those poems that we mentioned before, authored by female authors writing in Russian that were uh, just a, a few days after their publication online were translated into, into Ukrainian and vice versa. So we saw that this process of uh, reconnecting, we could say, the so-called Ukrainian Russian speaking and Ukrainian Ukrainian speaking cultural environments was uh, uh, was taking place really uh, through media, through uh, through web, and, and but also in Madan uh, Zaleshnosti in Independent Square uh, too. What has changed after that is that is exactly I, I believe something that depends on what we uh, described before as the need for institutionalizing the presence of Russian within Ukraine as separated also from the idea that became quite widespread in Ukraine of Russian as the enemy's language. Uh, this kind of a situation where in political debates, in cultural debates, uh, the um, value of speaking uh, uh, Ukrainian is assumed as uh, connected to the faith uh, and to the uh, faithfulness uh, to, the, uh, to the Ukrainian state, in a way created a kind of um, a kind of a, a fracture, even within the Russophone, um, um, the Russophone uh, literary community uh, in the country. You have mentioned the case of uh, Boris Kersonsky, that exactly in that uh, slide that I tried to uh, show before, where he, talk, where, where he talked about linguistic discomfort, he was trying to address uh, uh, critiques coming from other Russophone writers that were uh, criticizing him for switching uh, uh, to Ukrainian and starting to uh, claim the need to, uh, to switch to Ukrainian and inviting all the others uh, Russophone cultural actors to do the same. We see that the uh, positions undertaken by uh, individual authors were quite, quite different one from uh, the other one. And that's exactly something that is uh, really important to us because usually we assume, and here we come also to the uh, question the move, um, raised by Alina, uh, we assume that uh, a Russian-speaking cultural community should also uh, 
uh, and embody a unified political stance or cultural stance in the country. That's, of course, not true as for Ukraine. And uh, uh, this also, uh, in a way, became quite clear in the aftermath of the, of the revolution when uh, some authors decided to go on publishing uh, with the Russian publishers and so uh, decided, in a way, to continue uh, their own uh, career within the uh, realm of, uh, uh, of the, uh, um, of the uh, Russian culture as promoted by the Russian states, while other ones decided to uh, publish in Ukraine, in Ukrainian, even in Ukrainian translation, or, or even to switch to Ukrainian. That's exactly what, uh, uh, what Roman was, uh, was highlighting in his, uh, in, his, uh, in his speech, and I believe this is also a kind of uh, a dangerous direction that uh, a Ukrainian culture is taking nowadays because it is exactly this kind of direction that makes uh, the dehybridization of Ukrainian culture possible. And that's why also in the conclusions of my book, I tried to uh, mention the work of a young uh, poet uh, from uh, uh, Donetsk who has moved to Kiev, Hia Kiva, mm -hmm. uh, where he tried exactly to emphasize this aspect. She is uh, still aware of the possibility to be uh, to belong to the last generation of Russian-speaking authors in Ukraine, exactly for this reason. Because most of these authors that uh, started to uh, publish, the, publish in the main Ukrainian publishing houses in a Ukrainian translation actually became part of the uh, Ukrainian cultural realm uh, by switching and so by renouncing, in a way, to their own hybrid character while uh, other authors who went on publishing in, uh, in, uh, in Russian, in post-Maidan Ukraine, still uh, have to deal with this kind of uh, a low diffusion of their works within the country, or uh, are exactly renouncing to the wider public, the uh, wider audience that they could find outside of Ukraine. If we could also think about uh, a potential institutionalization of this cultural field, that so the creation of uh, um, and the support to uh, publishing uh, uh, houses, uh, publishing in Russian, in Ukraine, of course, the situation maybe could also change, and the possibility for a space for a Russian language culture in the country could be possible. Or, or at least this is the perception that I have as an external observer, uh, because most of the times, and this is also a case, the case of uh, uh, Zelensky's presidency, and so the first year of Zelensky's presidency, most of the times, uh, this uh, uh, subject uh, came there to be uh, touched in the political and cultural debate. Uh, it becomes quite clear that the, um, the um, public debate uh, is not ready to really, uh, to really think and to really address, address this need. We can just think about the so famous or unfamous uh, speech held by Zelensky for the New Year's Eve uh, where uh, he, wa he was trying, in, in a way, to deconstruct uh, these, uh, these categories, such as Russian and Ukrainian, but uh, uh, made it in a way that was, uh, in a way, welcomed by the Ukrainian debate as, uh, um, as uh, deconstructing the uh, Ukrainian identity itself, as it was always meant, as it was always considered. So I believe that uh, uh, this kind of, uh, of, uh, of change or this kind of uh, switch to hybridity can come from below, from uh, uh, Ukrainian society or from Ukrainian Russian language uh, uh, people and speakers, but of course needs also a kind of support from the top, from political institutions, to uh, be there or to maintain a kind of uh, a position without uh, feeling the need for uh, switching again to a, a Ukrainizing, we could say, a Ukrainocentric, Ukrainian-speaking centric uh, too. Okay, I guess we have no time left, but uh, two more questions from the audience, uh, and I think we should take the time uh, to bring them in. Um, so, first question by Domenico Valenza, who's a PhD fellow at Ghent University. Uh, he would like to know, um, 
In the framework of existing cultural cooperation between the European Union and Ukraine, what could the European Union authorities do to foster the recognition of Ukrainian Russian speakers and should they actually do something? This is the first. And uh, another question, um, a hypothetical. Um, by uh, Petro from Ukraine. Um, would Ukraine's Russophone literature have been much different if Russian aggression didn't happen in 2014? So maybe you could very briefly answer to this question. Uh, you, you have to turn on your microphone. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, once again, thanks for your questions. I'm very glad that, uh, in a way, this discussion could uh, raise uh, also uh, new um, new questions from from the audience. Uh, as for uh, the question posed by Domenico, um, I believe this is a, this is a, an important issue to discuss, and uh, um, that, uh, what the EU could do. I believe that um, uh, it is first and foremost an internal problem of uh, um, the Ukrainian cultural and political debate. And so, first and foremost, the uh, answer should come from Ukraine itself. Also, to, um, to give the possibility to uh, make this kind of uh, uh, cultural production in the country visible to the other Ukrainians and to accept it as a kind of natural phenomenon coming from below and without any specific support from the top. Of course, they, what they you could do, and what uh, uh, in some cases we are, have already witnessed that the EU did, is uh, um, to support uh, the uh, cultural events uh, in the country, exactly uh, claiming for the need uh, for discussing these issues. And so for creating a real and concrete platform for discussion in the country, or also promoting and financing potential publications of these authors in the uh, cultural field in the West. It is quite evident to uh, most of the external observers that uh, actually most of these authors, Ukrainian Russian language authors, became Ukrainians once they were published in the West. This is the case of uh, Andrei Kurkov or uh, the same Alexei Nikitin, uh, who I accidentally uh, came upon while reading a translation uh, his translation in Italian, where he was named as a Ukrainian Russian language writer, while in other cases I only found him uh, defined as, a, as a, a Russian writer from Ukraine. So this is also the question around the definitions uh, coming from the West or from, from Russia and Ukraine uh, themselves is quite, is quite interesting too. Um, uh, the, uh, as for the other question, would Ukraine's rules upon literature have been much different if Russian aggression didn't happen in 2014? Uh, this is uh, um, a very difficult uh, question to answer, but I believe that most of the, most of the dynamics that uh, um, were already uh, present and were already, um, uh, were already uh, characterizing the uh, cultural production, uh, rules upon production, in Ukraine before uh, the war, uh, I believe, were reactualized in the aftermath of, of the war, in the aftermath of the crisis, and maybe became uh, more uh, more evident. In my, while writing my book, actually, I, I I had a different perception of this issue, maybe because they were quite closer to the uh, to the uh, eruption of the war, and I believe that uh, something something new was happening or. Uh, something new was going to be added by these authors to what then uh, happened before the, uh, the revolution. Actually, uh, rereading re these works, so we can see that some of these dynamics uh, um, mostly come to be reactualized. And so I cannot see a real change as for the matters that are touched by the authors, but maybe uh, some of those urgent issues and political issues that are discussed by these authors become quite uh, uh, clearer and become quite uh, um, more important in, in the new works issued by the authors, because maybe they feel the need to answer such uh, uh, questions around identity and around their position in the cultural sphere of Ukraine. Especially, and here I conclude, um, especially because we should think that most of these authors who decided to uh, publish in Ukraine and who decided in a way to 
um, manifest and to express their own uh, closeness and their own faithfulness in the Ukrainian state uh, did not publish anymore in Russia. And so, in a way, also their, uh, their audience became, uh, became uh, uh, narrower. And, uh, and in a sense, they also started to address uh, a different kind of audience and a different kind of, of, uh, um, of interest as well of the Ukrainian audience themselves. Thank you so much. I guess we could go on for at least another hour, but um, we have to leave it here since time is over. I would like to thank all of our today's panelists and of course those who joined our stream and we will keep you posted about our upcoming events of uh, Russophone Voices. Uh, I would like to wish you a nice evening or day if you joined us from another time zone. Goodbye and Dasvidaniya.